Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Briggs, and I am the product manager for Post 16 English and Maths and Digital Skills here at Pearson. And welcome to our keynote address in the Festival of Functionality, the last of our sessions. And I, it's my pleasure today to introduce Johnny Kay, who's going to be doing the presenting. He is the head of teaching and learning at Newcastle College and a formal, former head of English and Maths as well. And he's also an author of Improving Maths and English in FE, a practical guide. So thank you very much. And over to you, Johnny. Thank you very much, sir. Good morning. How are you? I'm excellent. Thanks. Good. Some pleasant news before we get in. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hope we're all well. Um, I'll assume we are because uh, I've, I've got no way of finding out. Um, so let's crack on with it today. The, the session um, today functional skills in a, in a dysfunctional world. Number of things that I'll be um, covering. It's sort of, um, you know, part, part informative, I think, part some points for, for discussion, and also hopefully some strategies and some innovation that you can use within your own settings, within your own practice. Um, so let's crack on. Huh? So first, uh, first thing for me, just you know, a little bit of background about me. Not, hopefully, not uh, not so much, not so onerous. Um, CV on a page, and um, that's the probably the medium length version. Uh, the short version is that I was a pretty decent English teacher, so they put me in charge. Um, kept uh, being pretty decent at that, and led a couple of English and math departments before having the very good fortune to work as head of TLA at Newcastle College. I'm um, very fortunate to work here where they um, also allow me to hold the role of uh, lead English expert. Um, as, uh, as Chris said, also authored a book, Improving Maths and English, which I'll be trying to sell you liberally throughout this session. Um, so very, very excited to talk with everybody today, excited to be, uh, to be with Chris and talking to Chris. Um, let's look at you know some of the things that we've been dealing with this year, some of the things that we've been dealing with over the last few years. So the challenges and functional skills, what are those challenges? What are the things that, you know, have really been, uh, have been barriers to, to some of the success that we'd like to have with some of our students up and down the country? For me, a huge one, I think, you know, I was um, formerly a secondary school English teacher and head of English, um, coming into FE for the first time and, and seeing the contact time and centres, you know, an hour, an hour and a half. I'll be, I'll be frank with you, blew my mind um, when, I, when I first came into the sector. I couldn't quite believe it, um, especially with the GCSE three hours. Um, for me, that is a massive challenge. You know, how do we undo um, some of the, the problems that have been faced over the, the 10 years that most students have had in education before they come to us? How do we confront some of the misconceptions, the preconceptions in that time? So a real, real challenge. I think on top of that, We've got to look at the, the hangover from tags and cards, um, both from an assessment perspective and, and you know the grades that students are coming in with, um, but I think also from a, a perspective of building relationships. A lot of students have, have suffered over that over that time, both in terms of their academic studies, but also in terms of the, the, their emotional um, well-being and the mental health. So a lot of sort of and trust issues that a lot of students are coming in with, where you know they, they really felt they were going to get that grade in the first or the second year of COVID and lockdown, and they didn't, and they they come in with a level of anxiety and sometimes a, a level of mistrust with education, this homogenous mass that they sometimes see it as. And so a lot of challenges there that we've got to deal with as students come in, you know, in the first few days and weeks. For me, I think also you know defining that place for functional skills. I think. Mean, you know, too often seen as the as a poor relation to GCSE. It's certainly got a place. It's absolutely got a place. But is that place defined um, across the piece? Is there is there an, an equity or is there a quality for that uh, for that qualification at various levels? It needs to be as uh, as important as GCSE. It can be seen as important as GCSE is often perceived to be. Touched upon a little bit in terms of, of tag and card. Student engagement and expectations, really, really difficult to build relationships in an hour, an hour and a half per week. Um, we know that attendance across the country is roughly 75 to 80 percent. There are no official statistics for this, but I think you know we've all spoken to enough colleagues at enough colleges to know that it sits around 75 to 80 percent on a sort of informal average. Um, and it's difficult to build relationships in that time. And it's difficult still to set the expectations in terms of behavior, in terms of academic performance, 
In terms of, of motivating students, it's difficult to do that in the time that is available. For me also, I think in terms of time, we look at vocational staff and, and leadership engagement. It's very, very, very difficult um, to get leaders around the table, to get vocational staff around the table with the challenges that they face as well. They have significant challenges in terms of funding, in terms of timetable, in terms of the roles that they perform. It's very, very, very difficult for them to step away and look at English and maths in the depth and the detail that many of them would like. Um, I've been very, very fortunate, and I am very fortunate, to work in an organisation where English and maths is core and is key to everything that we do. However, that's not all possible in every college across the country. So we need to be able to invest in our vocational staff and, and in our um, leadership and make sure that time is available, relevant funding is available, relevant staffing and staffing routes are available to leaders and also that there is relevant training for vocational staff because you know embedding English and maths is such a core part of everything frankly it's not a, a vocational task or an English and math task English and math is important to everybody at all times if we look at putting this PowerPoint together there's you know there's a significant number of English and math skills that go into this I've been fortunate to receive the training is that possible everywhere we need to make sure that it is and I think as a, an extension of that, we need to have forums for and of collaboration. Now, I'll, I'll cover this in, uh, in detail later on the, uh, the talk this morning. Are there enough opportunities? Are there enough, you know, sort of semi-regulated opportunities, if you like, where we, you know, we have a standing agenda that gets to the core and gets to the heart of the issues? Um, do we have the time again to, to meet in these forums? Do people have opportunities to collaborate and to connect? To an extent, yes. Um, however, there is regularly a cost attached um, and it's not always accessible to all middle leaders or senior leaders or all staff. So I think that's something that we've got to look at. Now for me, heavily, heavily biased as I am, as a head of teaching and learning, um, good teaching and learning is everything. If you get that right, everything will be all right in the main. I know these are sort of uh, sweeping statements that, that Chris will pick me up on later on, I'm sure. Um, but if you get teaching and learning right, everything else is fairly simple. Um, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time looking at what those things are and then going into more detail um, for the majority of those points. Now, the number one thing for me in, in any department anywhere, and this is when I worked in, uh, in, the, in the private sector, worked in offices before I became a teacher, um, when I was a teacher in secondary, when I was a teacher in FE, leader in FE, leader in secondary, my wife works in Prime, I've seen it there. So consistency is absolutely everything. If you have solid routine, solid practices, and good sequencing, not just in your planning, but also in your own routines and your own practices, everything else will fall into place. Whether that be behavior management, whether that be the quality of teaching, whether that's assessment or feedback, good routines mean that you will be successful. And as part of that, we need to make sure there is good structure. So we need structure in planning, we need structure in the timing of events, as well as in sessions. When are any assessments, any formal assessments that you are going to put on, when are they? Does everybody know? Does everybody know what the processes are to get to those points? Is your planning well structured? Does it address everything that students need to know? both at a, an individual contextual level, but also at that wider grandstand level for the qualification that they are doing. Is there adequate coverage as well? And I think as part of that, we've got to make sure that we're differentiating, we're individualizing. All of our students are widely different. And for leaders, all of the staff, probably the same. So do we have the same message, a consistent message, going out in different ways to people to make sure they can access it in your teaching, but also then, in your teams. And for me, this also feeds in to assessment. So when we're assessing students, have they had the preparation that they need? Now, I'm not talking here about having a session with 20 students and 20 different tasks. Having said that, you know, we can differentiate and we can use different levels, levers and levels of support to make sure that our students can access assessment, can access sessions. Just, you know, a little bit more support, the learning support assistance, spending a bit more time with some students, giving a little bit more feedback to all the students. So in the assessment, we need to make sure there are opportunities for everybody to perform at all times and also a range of methods. 
standing on the door and welcoming students in is a method of assessment. It's not the only method of assessment. It's not a formal method of assessment, but it is a method of assessment. Speaking to students, asking questions. So we'll spend a little bit of time on that today. Key one for me also, we've got to collaborate, but there's got to be collaboration with accountability. So where we're in these forums, where we're collaborating, what's the impact? It's great to spend time together as professionals. It's great to spend time together as practitioners. It's great to do things like this and come and listen to people like me who apparently know things. Um, but we need the accountability as well. So, you know, you're going to conferences, you're meeting with people, you're in um, forums and discussion groups, and you're trialing new ideas. Fantastic. Excellent. But let's look at that bottom line of, is it helping students? If it is, do more of it. If it's not, reflect, evaluate, adapt, maybe change, maybe stop doing that thing. So we need to make sure that there's an accountability as well. So I want to spend a little bit of time looking at some of these things and, and some approaches that hopefully you'll find helpful in, uh, in combating some of the challenges and also uh, emphasising some of the things that, that in, in my opinion, make a real difference, which are the things that you can see on the screen. The first thing for me uh, is assessment. If, if we get assessment right, assessment tells us what we need and all that informs our plan. If you, if you haven't got informed planning, the, the, the content that you're teaching is not going to be as impactful. So we need to make sure that we get those initial assessments right, but we also need to make sure that we get ongoing assessment right. What the students need to know, how effective is our teaching? They're the big questions. So let's, let's look at how we can answer those. So assessment for me, effective assessment, um, I've read up on this a fair bit, um, I would say over the years, and these are the things that, that jump out of the literature for me. Um, it's got to be bespoke for your students and certain, and it's got to be regular. If you're giving something, you know, A-level initial assessment or a level one group, why are you doing it? I've never seen that, and I hope that it's not happening anywhere. Um, but we need to make sure that it's regular. We need to make sure that it is bespoke for our students, vocationally, contextually as well. I will say that a, a huge turn off for students are the high stakes, large assessments, the mocks, the, you know, the hour and a half of doing an assessment. Are we getting out of that what we're putting in? So if you think about the amount of time to prepare, to host, and then feedback on large scale mock assessments, do we get out of that what we'd like? My, my answer on the main is, is being no, um, we don't. We do too much massive assessment when students are coming in from schools or when they're coming in um, from employment. And for me, actually, it's going to be low stakes. So actually, if you don't do particularly well, we can accept that in the short term because there'll be opportunities to perform. There'll be opportunities to try again. And for that to happen, it's going to be short and focused. And we're going to look at an example in a moment. I think, again, what is sometimes lacking in those assessments, initial assessments, longer form assessments, final assessments, can you, can you share the information? Can you go out with vocational heads? Can you go out with directors, assistant principals? And can you give them that information? Do they actually know what it means? Can you share a spreadsheet with the head of construction where we see that question three, students have not performed particularly well. Do they have a clue what that means? So we need to be able to get the support of our vocational staff, our vocational lecturers, our vocational leaders, our senior leaders, and we get that in the main. But I think to make sure that we get the support that we want in the way that we want, we need to communicate a message of what we need from them. So we have a particular problem with this math skill. You can see that from the information I've sent. Can you start to teach that in some of your sessions? Can you put a starter in the vocational session just to reinforce that message? The best way for me to do this is low stakes quizzes. Now, if we've not come across this before, I'll briefly explain what they are and how they work, and I'll go over a couple of examples as well. So, low stakes assessments, really, or low stakes uh, quizzes, should be um, completed for me every week as a minimum. Um, I would say, really, every lesson that we can do it because they, they do make that much of a difference. Roughly five to ten minutes long. It shouldn't take any longer than that because if you do take it longer than that, we're going to have that situation where some students have finished, some students are, are at a point where they can't access some of the questions and they start and, and potentially we get some, some challenging behaviours. We need to make sure that we assess a range of topics and skills. And I'll, again, I'll, I'll have uh, an opportunity to, uh, to show you what that looks like. Big thing for me is, a, is a, an ex secondary school English teacher is staring down uh, the barrel of. 35 Romeo and Juliet assignments on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, that's a Sunday afternoon that I'm never going to get back. 
and there were so many of them. So we need to make sure that students are doing just as much work in giving feedback as we are, um, because it helps them to understand what they're strong with and what they need more support with. So we need to delegate that workload, and I'll cover that in a second. And a big one, there's a line that I always use to get a, a bit of a smile off people. Any, anybody ever been to a pub assessment? Would you go to one? A pub assessment? Would you go to like, it's like a pub quiz, but you've got to sit inside for an hour and a half. Would you go? You wouldn't go, would you? So it, 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 so it seems a small thing, but the terminology makes a massive difference. We call them quizzes, not assessments. If it's assessment, we spread the message that we're testing all the time. And students have, we must remember, neg negative experiences and negative perceptions of tests and assessments. So we call the thing a quiz. Tiny little difference, but it really does make a little difference. Assessment is high stakes, it's scary, it's frightening, it's stressful. Quiz, low stakes, accessible. So let's have a look. Now, uh, we're going to look at two examples. One's an English one, one's a maths one. Um, different elements to them. For me, this layout is, is the most effective way to do it. Um, where we have it on a, a sort of a big, uh, where we have it listed on a page, <clears throat> excuse me, we have it listed on a page. This can seem a little bit daunting to students. Where we just have these boxes, really accessible, so really simple to actually get on with it and crack on. Um, there are two types of questions that work very, very, very well. One with only one defined answer. Um, so that more applicable generally to maths. Um, if we can't have just one defined answer, so if we look at say, you know, give the definition of a metaphor, every single student is going to give a slightly different response. And if you don't give exactly the answer that they've got, hands will go up and they will say, well, I've put this, is that right? And that's going to take more than your 10 minutes or you're going to have to mark every single one, which is workload. So if instead we say, you know, um, if we said, give an example of formal language, you're going to have to mark them all. You're going to have to look at every single one. If we say, which of the below is an example of formal language? Again, we get an idea not only of does a student have that knowledge, but we also get an idea of students thinking. If they pick something that is not correct, we might have a bit of a window into their thought process. So we can identify a misconception or a preconception and we can correct it. So again, I would say no more than nine questions. Grid format, either only one answer is right or multiple choice. If we have this every week and if students mark this, students are then able to identify what they're strong with, what they're not so strong with, and they have a revision resource automatically building up week on week on week. So where we have potentially functional skills students sitting in exam in December, they'll have 10 of these, showing them what they need to revise, showing them what they can do less revision with. What I would also say is, always align a particular topic to a particular question. And what I mean by that is, number two is organizational features on this particular quiz that you can see at the minute. So always make question two about organizational features. Number one is about formal language. Always make number one about formal language. The reason we can do that is because if we regularly see that a student is getting number one wrong, we know that it's formal language. We can quickly go around the classroom and see that you know, seven out of 12 students are getting number two wrong. So we know that we need to teach some more organizational features or give it some more coverage. In terms of maths, similar. Um, either we go multiple choice, much easier in maths to just have um, one answer, two out of two is not four or five, sometimes six. Um, it's just four, always. Um, again, if we look at um, one, it's the percentages and, and decimal. If we make number one always percentages and decimals, then we know that if a student is struggling with question one, it's percentages and decimals. That's what they need to revise. That's what we need to teach. The student looks back in February and sees that um, out of 14 weeks, eight weeks, they've got number one wrong. They know that they need to revise percentages and decimals, and that's what they need to work on. So we really quickly assess. We really quickly capture data without having to you know, put everything on a spreadsheet or necessarily log everything or track everything or round everything up somewhere. But we can do that as well. So if we set your entire class, we just collect these in at the end of the session or as students are working later on in the session. I have seen it where a teacher will identify that there is an issue with, with area, that students really struggle with calculating area. They found this out inside the first six minutes of the session, went around the room, 
I identified this in the majority of the session when the quizzes were done, stopped the session, called it, moved on, and just plugged that gap really quickly. So we have these micro teach opportunities. What we also have is a, is a good behavior management technique because we have consistency and we have routine. Students know, for want of a better phrase, to come in, sit down, shut up, and crack on. So they know what to do, how to do it. So we have that routine embedded. If a student can't do number one, what do you do? We do number two, do number three. If we have one starter up and a student can't do it, we have an issue, we have a challenge, we have an opportunity for, for challenging behavior to thrive, for a form to come out, for a discussion to start. If they know what they're meant to do, how they're meant to do it, why they're doing it, we'll crack on. So for me, a really positive technique. A lot of people say, you know, what about the workload? Well, if you're in a department with 10 people, we've got 35 weeks, do three and four each. Where we do a mock, students remember the mock. They remember what was on the mock. So we don't always get an accurate picture. With these, students don't remember these. So you can use these year on year on year. So yes, a little bit of extra work at the beginning on a summer on now, but once it's done, it's done forever. But I would say again, make sure there's consistency. So if you're putting number one as language features or as uh, percentages in the decimal, make sure the people in your department are doing that as well. So make these collaboratively. Now on that note, uh, Chris, it's almost like I planned this, you know, it's almost like I put this together in some sort of sequence. Uh, behavior management is absolutely key. Probably the main challenge that, that we get. Um, and what are the issues, you know, I've got to go over them. Um, when, I, when I do this in one of my training sessions in colleges or with my team or with people across Newcastle College, and I tend to ask, what are the issues, what are the challenges that we face? Everybody comes back with the same one. I'll be, I'll be totally honest with you. You know, I've, I've, done, uh, I've done sessions outside of my setting in my college. Going to other colleges, and I see some of this when I'm, when I'm running sessions, a little form comes out, or, you know, there'll be a little bit of chat or a little bit of that. <laughs> Maybe that speaks more to the quality of my sessions than it does to, uh, to the behavior of the staff. That's something I'll need to reflect on. Um, but these are the challenges that we see. These are the things really that you know keep coming back, um, regardless of what age or what level we're teaching at. So how, how can we sort this out? You know, what are the sorts of things that we can do to make sure that we, we have this compliance, that we have positive behavior, that students really are engaged in the set? The first thing for me is we've got to set expectations early and we've got to do it collaboratively. If we do things to people, they're much, much less likely to be complying or to get engaged. So if we had to say, these are the rules, shut up, follow them. Uh, if you don't, that's it. You, you know, it's all the way in this college. If we're going to say that, that's not going to go down particularly well. So we need to have that conversation nice and early. You know, if you're in a workplace, what are the expectations that an employer would put on you? Where you've had a job, whether it is, you know, working behind a bar, whether it's been working in the service industry, whether it's running Google, you know, what are the expectations? Have that discussion, frame that around the expectations that we have for, um, in, within a college, make sure that we make relevant adaptations. Um, a really, really basic and simple one. And this is, you know, a lot of you are going to say, well, you know, they should know. They should know. Yeah, but they might not. So check. So, you know, the number of times where I pull the student and say, you know, can you stop repeating? And I'm sort of, you know, as I've that student never been taught. And that is ridiculous. It is ridiculous that we have to do that, but do it. Make sure the expectation is set. Students know what is acceptable. Students know what is unacceptable. Clarify that early. You cannot move on without clarifying that early. Big one for me, before we get into the, you know, the nuts and bolts of actually what this can look like, we need to make sure that what we're doing is fair and honest and proportionate. We, we, you know, we all hear those horror stories of teachers who, who are ejecting students for not having a pen. I'm, I've got a pen on me now. So if I were to go into a meeting, I'd draw one up on me, so I wouldn't have a pen. I've been in meetings with people where they've not brought a pen. It's just one of those things. Do we know that a student has uh, even got a pen in the house? Can not afford it? You know, so make sure that we delve a little bit, we see why the behaviour is happening, and then when we do respond, that it's fair, that it's honest, that it's proportionate. We don't send a letter home for, for lateness if the lateness is due to a bus or it's due to another um, member of staff. Um, having a session before you that's on a different side of the campus or a different side of the college. So we need to make sure that we're fair because, again, this is how we build relationships. So we need to speak to students when we see this challenging behaviour so that we get the root of why it's there. A big part of that is taking ownership. Are we bouncing everything back to the vocational lecture, the vocational head? Your students, you deal with it. As best we can, as best our, our systems will allow. 
Now, the example that I always use here is as a, as a child, I was a, I was a rascal. I can say this now. I've outgrown it. I was a rascal, and uh, my mum would say to me, you know, you better you better work. Your dad gets in. I'm going to tell you that. And I think, well, he's at work for another forty minutes, so I've got another hour and a half. And I just mess around for another hour and a half, knowing that I was all right until the dad came. Uh, and it's a similar sort of thing. As teachers, you know, the head of department may step in and the head of department may cool the class for you, calm the class down. But what that says to students is that you can't handle it, you can't cope, or you're not willing to invest. So where we where we pass over that responsibility all the time on a regular basis, and there will be opportunities where it is needed, where we need to go directly to the tutor, but where we can, we need to deal with it ourselves. We need to log properly on ProMonitor or eTracker or whatever system we use. What was the behavior that was seen? Why was this a challenge? What was the impact? What did you do about it? So if we take ownership, behavior will improve. Yes, again, a little bit more work. However, in the long run, you get better behavior, better outcomes, your students achieve and perform. So it is a more positive environment. And I'm gonna say this again, what expectations have we set? Students will meet your expectations. If we set high expectations, we'll meet them. If we set low ones, they'll meet them too. If you expect nothing of them, we'll give you nothing. Whether that is in terms of the behaviour, outcomes, achievement, performance, attitude, whatever. If you expect them to be miserable, they'll be miserable. And um, there are times where I have uh, you know, brought positivity to a class by sheer force of will, by just refusing to accept that people are in a bad mood. Now, I know there's one or two on this who know me uh, very well, and they'd be thinking, what you? Um, but yes, that, that did happen. Um, so for me, you know, think a lot about expectations, talk a lot about how we set those expectations. Big thing for me, rules. Keep your rules simple. Colleges with 20 and 30 rules, no. We need simple rules. We need ethos, we need culture, we need to build them collaboratively. So what does that look like? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it, and Chris, you know, I'm sure you'll point this out if this doesn't work. I'm going to try and fit every single rule that you might have in a college, the staff, the students, for everybody, into one rule. Be hard working and always give your best. That's everything. I haven't got a pen. I've been hard working, I've given you best. You're on your phone. I've been hard working, I've given you best. Students are late, regularly going to turn, swearing, throwing a chair at you, uh, turning up with a fully cooked chicken in a bag. Uh, stuffed with roses and quality street. That happened to me in the year 10 lesson about 10 years ago. Uh, are you hard working? Are you giving your best? Now, the lady with the chicken, not so much. So I was able to say and ask the question, are you being hard working? Are you trying your best? If you need more, all right, let's have a look at some more. Are you being ambitious to strive for the best? Are you being ambitious? Ask that middle leaders, ask that of your staff. Ask that of senior leaders. Senior leaders, ask that of your, of your teachers. Ask that of your students. Christ, let's, let's ask that of each other. Are you being ambitious? Do you want the best? Because if you don't, why are we here? I'm open to have a four hour, ten day to day. Nobody gets out of bed with that mentality. So let's smash it and let's communicate that to students. Again, simplicity of rules. Show resilience and be accepting of feedback. We've all had meetings where we've told, you know, that wasn't quite good enough or that needs to improve. Whether that's as a, as a six year old in a math session, whether it's as a, a 20 year old in a functional skill session. Whether it's in a in appraisal meeting in a job again, you know the CEO of Google, he has to do these things. And then last couple for me, be thankful and respectful to others. I mean, frankly, you could fit all of these in. Just you know, be nice. Hey, be nice. You know, you're late. Hey, be nice. Uh, make sure that yourself aware and regulated. These five rules, one of them would do, but every single behaviour challenge that we've looked at fits into those rules. So set your rules collaboratively and set your rules early. And um, what I would also say is that um, if we see Jurassic Park, where you the Velociraptors test the fence every now and again, uh, your students will do that in terms of behavior management. If, you, if, you, if you're a middle leader, your staff will do that. It's, you know, it's basic sort of human behavior. You'll test the parameter. So make sure that we are regularly going back on these rules, regularly highlighting them, regularly using them. If you have a launch it and leave approach, you know, these are the rules, and we never speak about them ever again. Um, they're not going to they're not going to be applied so i think also for me you know it's not necessarily rule it's an ethos uh, you know it is a big a big old block of eat and cheese it is a bit david brent and my staff will cane me for this because i am a bit david brent um i, I live my life by those rules you know when, when i'm sort of playing with my kids i'm 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 not being away and i'm giving my best you know when i'm when i'm sort of in in the relationships that i've got with my friends and with my wife and with the people that i know i sort of follow that as a 
as a as an ethos, as a culture, for my entire life, and when I'm good at it, I'm happy. So, big thing for me in terms of being the more practical approaches, and um, we need to prepare. So, uh, too often we have where we see these challenges, where we see these behaviour issues, it's because there's not been the correct preparation gone into it, or there's not been time for that preparation. Now, some of these you may look at and say, you know, I don't have time. That's fine. You know, we have ways and means to get around that as well. Behaviour, there's not a single silver bullet that's going to fix everything. It is not a sort of, you know, one approach that'll sort everything out. You're always going to get a chance. What we actually need to do is just make enough small steps. And we need to be consistent with those small steps. And we find that we have positivity and we have engagement. So let's look at it. Big one for me, massive one for me. Your feng shui, your disco space, the layout of your room. Is the layout of your room such that you can get around it? So I always, you always need three spaces where you can teach your session from. The front of the room, the middle of the room, and the back of the room. Wherever you cannot get to, that's where the problems are going to start. If there are people in the corner of a room that you can't reach, they'll be on phones at times, they will have discussion because you can't get anywhere needed. The biggest deterrent to challenging behaviour is your proximity to that behaviour. If somebody is on a phone, if somebody is having a discussion potentially that they should not be having, if she needs, it's being smoked in Darren, behind Sarah's back, that is going to be the talk of the town in that session. If you can get anywhere near it, if you can stand next to that conversation, it stops. If you can stand next to a student who is texting or on a phone, it stops. Most of us would trust our neighbors and neighbors, we trust people we work with, we trust our friends. How many of us would willingly hand over our phones and say, carte blanche, look at whatever you like, look through everything? Very, very few. Students are exactly the same. If you just stand next to them when they're on the phone, it'll go away because they don't want you to see the message or the picture or whatever it is. So being able to get around the room is absolutely vital. Another thing, uh, I saw something on Twitter the other day, you know, build relationships. Is, you know, that's how we do it. And no one ever says how you do it. But one of the steps is just greeting people on the door for a few reasons. One, you cut off any behavior that may enter your room as a challenge. So we've got a couple of uh, couple of sports students that are having a bit of a, a tickle off, a tickling each other in the corridor. I've seen this, uh, 18 year olds tickling each other, uh, where we have, you know, a couple of people who are upset about, you know, a night out that happened on the weekend or, you know, something like that. If you allow that into your room, it becomes the focus. So if we stand on the door, we can cut it off. Can you just wait there for me just for a second? Is everything okay as we let other people in? Don't have a pen, don't have equipment, have it on the door. Have you got a pen? No, there you go. In we go. It sends a message, I've thought about you, I've prepared, I want you to succeed. It sends a message also, I care so much. I'm at the door to say hello to you, I'm excited to see you. And we ask the little questions before they cross that, uh, that white line into the session. The, you know, we can ask the sort of semi fair and formal question. You have a good weekend. What have you had last lesson? What have you had for your dinner? What's, you know, this, this weather, what's it like outside? How did you get on with that driving lesson you had the other week? To actually show that you care. People work for others who are invested in them. Where we have a line manager or a senior leader in the private sector, in education or wherever, we get these stories. We see this, you know, the great resignation or whatever following COVID. We see this where people who don't feel invested in, you know, you see this on, on uh, exit surveys I've seen in LinkedIn, mainly in the private sector, but it applies. Where we see that people are, uh, are leaving organisations, it's because they don't feel invested in them. They don't feel that, you know, the line manager um, cares about their progression or their development. And we need to do the same with you. Now, every single time I mention a student plan, people say, oh, it's a bit schooly, you know, it's a bit schooly. People don't do it in school because it's, you know, students are 15. People do it in school because it works. We need to have some say over where students stand up, sit or be, um, because we need to be able to get to the people who need support the most. And that's not just necessarily in terms of behaviour. That might be in terms of uh, special educational needs. That might be in terms of making sure that people who are not as high achieving as we would like can achieve better. And they work with people of, of you know, ranges of uh, ability and achievement. Um, people say, well, I've tried those, but they won't sit where I put them. Fair enough. If you can, beat them there, put their books or portfolios or folders out where you want them to sit. So get to the session before them, lay the books where you want them to be, and tell them to sit where the book is. Now, if you are sort of telling them where to be and where not to be, you'll get a bit of challenge, a bit of kickback. If the book's already there, very unlikely they'll stand up, go to a PA and say, you need to move because I want to sit there. Very unlikely they'll do it. So they'll, they'll give each other less challenge than they'll give you because there are repercussions outside of the session for that. 
So make sure that we can control or have some control over where students are in the session. That's hugely important. Not as important as making sure that everybody has something to do. The, probably for me, the single biggest thing is that well, other than sort of having that mobility around the classroom, if people have something to do, they're less inclined to do the things that you don't want them to do. And conversely, if you don't have something for them to do, they will find something. So we need to make sure that if that maybe given out a book or given out resources, whether that's that differentiated challenge, those starters that I showed you, those low stakes quizzes, whether that's feedback from previous sessions or written feedback, again, we need to make sure there's a routine. We need to make sure that students have a task to do on entry. Get them in, get them sat, get them quiet, get them grafted. And please buy a clicker. Now, I was I was uh, slapped down by a colleague at uh, Liverpool College this week when I said that you can get these on Amazon for 20 quid. Apparently, you can get these clickers on Amazon for like six pounds. I've not seen these ones. I've been wasting my money. Um, be more bad is key. And to be more bad, get a clicker. If you are tethered to the laptop, tethered to the computer, the conversation starts in the corner of the room. You can either ignore it, stop your lesson and go over there. And if you stop the lesson, everybody's looking at you. Or call it out from your seated position at the front, and that stops the lesson and everybody's looking at this behaviour instead of the session. You can teach, you're mobile, you can flick around. And to be fair, you know, at times we would say that challenge of behaviour. One of these has got a laser pointer on it. And I just shined a laser pointer just on the student's book. See, the laser pointer realised it should be looking up. The behaviour was all right. Um, so little tiny bits, just walking around the classroom um, or moving around the classroom or again being mobile. And if you can't be mobile, send, get yourself in the centre of the session so that you can look around and you can see everything so that you can be closer to any challenge. Similar for me, that engaging starter is vital. Uh, now three, three types of starter, the one that assesses, the one that engages and the one that does both. You need to decide which is, is best for your session, for your individual class, for your individual students. If you don't have something for them to do on entry, students will find something to do and it will not be what you want them to do. So we need to make sure that we have these elements in place. Most of those things we can do with very minimal effort and all will have a large impact. Big one for me, you know, we don't get to, we can't get to the lesson before. Students, okay, so whoever's in there before you, yeah, tell them not to let the students in or lock the door. Uh, where we, you know, we have uh, a lecture who moves all the tables on a different configuration. Get the students to fix it or change your seating plan. So don't, do, you know, don't come across that first barrier anymore. I've got one challenge, I'm not going to fix it. Just keep fixing the challenge. That's how we become successful. That's how we become consistent. Uh, in terms of behaviour management, structure and time when we're in there, absolutely key. So do students know what they've got to do, why they've got to do it, how they've got to do it, when they've got to do it, where they've got to do it. Do they know all the elements that they've got to achieve? And I think too often we, we don't use questions effectively enough. Um, and what we do is we say, you know, does everybody understand that? Everybody got, anybody got any issues? Who's going to put their hand up for that? Just go around. What do I want you to do? Champion, thank you very much. How long will it take? Where do I want you to do this? And this allows individual students to achieve. What, what have I got to do? Oh, well, we're, we're writing a letter. Great, achieving, well done, success. A little dopamine hit and we move on. We build a relationship again. I think also we need to make sure that the students fully understand the task and to do that, we need to preface, you know, what I want you to do today is, and if you get students to do this thing and you also want them to do that thing, and you're explaining this, just tend to stop listening about there. So this is wrong. They don't do this effectively. So we preface with, when I say go, you will. When I count to three, you will do this. And then we explain it. So we make sure we have attention as we're doing this. The, there's got to be a focus and an urgency in terms of time as well and signaling of time and transition. So we need we need students to know, you know, we've got five minutes, we've got seven minutes, and they need to have a sort of visual representation of that. So embedded timers within PowerPoints are a phenomenal way of doing that. There's a reference in this PowerPoint, which you'll you'll get the resource for. A6 training, the letter A, the number six, the word training, all one word, .co.uk, there are some PowerPoint timers that are phenomenal for helping students to self-regulate. They look up and say, oh, I've got three minutes left, I better crack on. So having that sense of urgency. If you give students an hour and a half to do something that takes 10 minutes, they'll spend an hour and a half doing it. So we've got to give students the right amount of time, the right amount of focus, and make sure that they are aware of the timing as well. Big one for me is teaching like nothing else is, is performance. Um, we, we're all putting some sort of act on when we're in a working environment, but in front of students, it's actually can be a completely different person. 
Um, I certainly, I'm a totally different person when I'm speaking, totally different. I'm engaging and funny and, uh, and, and really happy. Um, that's a, a, an in-joke for those who I know who are watching today. Um, why? You know, you block out the, the cast being ran over, your energy bills just come in. One of the tyres has gone in your car and it's devastated your week or your weekend or your month's face. And you come in and you put a face on and you go for it. Why? Anybody would ever teach anything like students at all. I have no idea because it's a waste of time. The people who are listening, they'll get it and they'll try on. The people who aren't, you're going to have to do it again. So by teaching when people are talking, you double your workload. So if we've got to count, you know, five, four, three, two, one, if we've got to go and stand next to people who are talking, if we've got to give uh, a resource out on a sheet and sort of say, this is what I want you to do, go, you know, whatever we've got to do, do not teach over there. Talk. I think a big part of this also, and this is something that I do want you to try at home with partners. Because where we're asking, please, we're asking that somebody will comply, yes or no. Now, I've not been in too many classrooms where a teacher wants a student to say no. You know, we do this bit of work, please. No. All right. Uh, okay. What do I do now? Where we ask, please, we are asking, do you want to do it? Do you not want to do it? And students will be, will be justified in saying no. Where we say thank you and move away, we are so confident in what we are asking that students don't really have a choice other than to comply. Can you do this, please? No. And then you're engaged in a, in a conversation. Can you do this? Thank you. And then move away. Much more likely to comply. Even if they do say no, you've moved away, you've said thank you, and they'll eventually crack on. Huge one. Again, the question in. We have three to 400 questions today. We tend to give about, the research varies, but you know, the, this one of the main pieces says that we give about three seconds of thinking time. That's not enough. So we need to give longer. We need to use our questions wisely. We need to make sure that we give uh, more sophisticated questioning, which we'll cover in a second. But we also need to make sure that within these questions, students have relevant answers inside. So a, a little trick, because I don't have a bad one for, you know, two, three seconds. Just do a little count in your head. One, two, three, four. Think a bit and give some more. If we say it slowly enough, it's 10 seconds of thinking time. Stupid little trick, but it works. It works a trick. But make sure that we give students a relevant time. Not asking questions like, is everything all right? You know, those closed questions. They'll not give you an answer. Or they'll give you the answer that you want. And they'll move on. And that'll be it. So we're going to cover question in, um, in, in just a second. So... Last little bit on behavior management in terms of, of relationship. We need to invest in students. So we need to make sure that you know, they know that we care about them. Stand on the door, have the discussion, have the relationship, care. If you don't care, pretend to care. You should care. That's what the job is for me. And um, well, you know, where I find people who sort of say that you know they dislike students, you don't know them. And where students say, you know, I dislike the teacher, you don't know them, you don't know that teacher. Um, we need to share where appropriate, and you know, we need to talk about you know. What we feel about certain topics about certain subjects, you know, where we see the challenge behavior, let, let them know it really upset you. Again, we need to be appropriate. We can't cross that line. We must make sure we are professional, we are the teacher, and that relationship continues. But we can have conversations. And a big part of that is understanding those starting points. What school did they go to? What was that school like? What was their experience like? Um, you know, where they the star pupil in that uh, in that school. Where they shoved in in a cupboard somewhere, so I thought they were independent work for a couple of years. I've encountered both. What were the relationships like with students? What are relationships like at home? Do they live at home? You know, do they have relationships with with uh, with family? Do they live with uh, parents? Guys, important to know these things. You have to know them. We also need to know the relationships that students have with each other. If I'm to sanction one student, what will be the impact on their group of friends? What will be the impact on those relationships? Now, not for a second am I saying don't do this, but I'm saying have it in mind because, you know, where we sanction one student, we may lose or damage a relationship with two or three others. It may, it's necessary to do it, but we know we need to know what's coming. I think we also need to look and think about, you know, where you are giving a sanction. Think about how you would feel if the, if the roles were reversed. Are you being fair? Are you being honest? Are you being proportionate? And we need to remember for me, you know, we talk about this ethos. Everything you do is for the students. So everything that we're doing is about the students. Anything challenging that you get back, we need to remember it's just a job. I have been called many, many, many variations um, of, of uh, unpleasant variations of not having any hair and not having any glasses. Uh, both of which are true. 
And the reason I don't care is because the students don't really know me. They don't know me like, I've got, you know, I've got a lovely family. I've got a nice house. And I'll remember that when it's going negative, when I get, uh, you know, in previous uh, roles where I've had chairs thrown at me and, and you know, being sworn at and had some unpleasant things said, I think actually, you know, it's just a job. It's all right. It's okay. It's tough to do that. I know. I know that it's not that simple. But where it's successful, I think, you know, I helped, I helped with that. I supported that. Shouldn't get in that, uh, you know, that pass or that grade four or, you know, moving into that apprenticeship, moving into that job, progressing on to the next level in vocational study. I have part of learning. So I think we've got to make sure that we have, we have those sort of defining lines. Um, and I, I, you know, I used to uh, work many years ago with a member of staff who said, you know, I don't like him and I, he knows I don't like him. And I thought, you're never going to get anything out of that student. So we need to like something about every student, even if it's just the shoulders. Um, the silly little line, I love that line, I'll be honest. That's, I told you, I said that yeah, I was a big David Brent, and now it's coming, it's coming to like, it's coming true. We've got to like something about all of them, even if it's just the pencil case they've got, or the shoelaces, or the way they walk, or the glasses they've got on. We've got to like something about every, about all, you know, about everyone. Because if you don't, they'll know, and they'll not work for you, and they'll not achieve. And quite frankly, the job and a student's life chances and a student's opportunities to achieve are bigger than your personal opinions about them. And I include myself in this because, you know, every single thing that I'm, I'm going through today is as a result of me doing the opposite of it. Uh, so I've come to these conclusions through making the mistakes. Uh, so, you know, I've been there, but I've disliked the students and I've, I've, I've had to have a good long look at myself and say, sort yourself out. Um, so we need to like something um, about every single one. And now the last, last couple of bits from, uh, from me. Um, massive one, questioning. So it's so simple, so little preparation, so little resource required, and we're not getting it right now. Um, so we're going to look at the sort of prevailing approaches, we're going to look at the existing approaches, and we're going to look at actually how we can improve those. So the main approaches, or the main singular approach, is either IRE or IRF, the same thing. Um, initiation, response, evaluation, or initiation, response, and feedback. Um, now, these are, as I say, the... Uh, Excuse me for this thing. Sorry. Yeah. Um, these are the, the prevailing approaches. They're really simple. You ask the question, student gives you an answer, you tell them what you think. Uh, you know, what, where's the formal language at in this? What is the crack? Well done. Oh, no, that's wrong. Try again. Um, challenges with it, and the, you know, the reason that potentially we shouldn't do this is one, it's, it, it takes ages to get around everybody. Um, if you don't get around everybody, you don't know what they can do, what they can't do. Um, you tend to pick on students who you know will give you the right answer anyway, so you're not really assessing them, you've already done it. You just start making yourself feel good that you, you know that a student knows the answer to one of the questions back. Um, and also, we don't give that time, we don't give that thinking time. So we need an alternative approach. Now, that alternative approach for me is PPPB. Let's have a look at it, what is it? So first thing that we're going to do, we're going to pose a question to everybody. We're going to ask everybody in this class a question. Um, or we ask a question and we tell them that anybody might be selected to answer it. We've then got to take a bit of time, we've got to pause, we've got to give them sufficient time to formulate a response. No hands up, no talking to each other, um, although we can do this in groups and pairs, I'll get on to that in a second. Ask the question to everybody, give them a bit of time to think about it, and then we're going to ask for a response, we're going to pass. Not literally, I'm not Stress this, do not jump on people. Um, so we're going to pass, we're going to ask for a, a response. So you ask the question, um, you know, what, what do we think this extract would, uh, would, you know, how would this extract impact a reader? How would this make a reader think, or how would this make a reader think? Darren, I'm going to ask you today, Darren. Darren gives you an answer, I'm not going to give you any feedback. I'm going to bounce. So I'm not going to tell you whether you're right or wrong. I'm just going to say thank you for the contribution. You know, really, really interesting answer. Not good, not bad, just interesting, or thank you. And then I'm going to bounce to another student, and I'm either going to ask the question again, um, or ask for you know, the same response to the same question, or I'm going to say, what do you think of Darren's answer? Do you agree with Darren's answer? Yes or no, and why or why not? Because where we sort of say, you know, question, answer, feedback, um, we don't have the ability to assess anybody else, because we give the feedback, we give the answer. Um, so we need to be able to assess students. So with one question, you can assess five students. If we do this in groups, you know, if we do this maybe in pairs and have that discussion, we make sure we get around, we've got the clicker, we make sure we, uh, we circulate, 
we can sort of ear wig on all of these conversations and assess that way as well. Then we get the answers and you get an answer from every single person in the in the lesson. We've relatively few questions. Or we can do it individually. And when you're talking to one question for one question for one answer, the other 15 people in the room aren't being set. So it's much more efficient, it's much more effective, it's much less work, and it gets them, it gets the students to do a lot more. Now in terms of the rules of it, explain the premise to them, tell them what it is and how it works. Make sure they know nobody can shout out or interrupt. It does promote higher order thinking. Um, it is more challenging. We had a, a guy called Steve Ingle come in recently, fantastic, uh, fantastic trainer, um, former senior leader and, and teacher. Um, and he made a statement, you know, when something is more challenging, that's where real learning happens. You know, you think about where you go to the gym. If you're lifting five grams, uh, you know, doing, doing a bench press of five grams, you're not going to come out like Alan Schwarzenegger. You've got to lift the big weights. You've got to challenge yourself. It's exactly the same when we're in the classroom. We need a challenge to make sure that real learning occurs and that we have that stickability. So whatever we do, teach, stay. Um, and so what we need to do is, is provide more challenging questions. Similar as I've said, you know, that pause for me is absolutely key. We need to make sure that students have enough time to actually formulate a response. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, I just thought I'd include this resource so you can actually go and plan some questions. And um, so essentially, where we're top left is the easier question. Um, you know, if I've got my mobile phone here, what, what is it? What does it do? What's the phone you make phone for? When I get to the bottom, how might, how might we use this? Oh, you might have a conference, or you might go to business from it, or you might, you know, do all of your work from it, or you might plan a party on it, or you might FaceTime, or you might use, you know, your, your, your application. So where we ask the how might question, the closer to this bottom right-hand corner that we get, the more challenging the question is. So again, um, just a resource for you to go with. The last couple of bits for me, vocational um, collaborations, is one of the things that I'd highlighted earlier is that there's a potential challenge. Where I do see this as a potential challenge, the English and maths, um, say the English and maths teachers, English and maths practitioners, absolutely have it within the power to go and, uh, and defeat that challenge and get rid of some of those barriers. And this is how we can do it. Now, the first thing for me is, is joint planning. As much as um, our vocational colleagues will um, have the maths and English abilities and have those skills, we need to direct those skills. They don't necessarily know what the spec is. They don't necessarily know what the you know the common areas for improvement are within your centre, within your region, within the country. So plan with them and just say, can I have a look at your scheme of learning? Right here, you're doing this topic. That's a fantastic opportunity to embed a uh, measuring area and teach some area. I will send you the resources that I use. Please embed them into that session. Most of us have been taught maths one way in primary school, one way in secondary school, one way from parents. We then have students who are in FAU get a, a fourth way. We then potentially have revision resources or online materials that are a fifth way. If they reach it a second year, there's likely it's going to be a sixth way as well. It's not consistent. If we have a student with being taught area or being taught structural features by the English and math teacher in one particular way, they then go into vocational sessions and it's taught in the same way, you get a double hit. So share the resources. I think also in different sessions, go and have a look in vocational sessions. Get them into your session. This is our teacher. Come and have a look. And um, part of that is your marketing and your PR. You don't know, get the posters up around the college. If you, if you get uh, grade four, you get level two with um, English and maths. You make about £100,000 more a year. Why is that not on a billboard at every college? Hundred grand, £100,000. Make two more thousand pounds a year, every year, if you get these. Get on a billboard. Um, so identifying their needs is massive. And then the very last little bit from me, just around network and collaboration and that accountability. Network and collaboration are fantastic, but there's got to be some accountability. You've got to hold yourself accountable, and I think you've got to hold your colleagues accountable as well. Not in the, you know, we hear accountability and we think about, you know, action plans and, and performance improvement plans. Accountability is everywhere at all times. You know, I'm accountable as a father and as a husband and as a friend, I'm accountable. Um, so are we holding ourselves accountable in the right ways? Um, and I think, you know, to do that, we need to believe in this culture. So we need to believe that um, we need to improve in some way because we do. Um, so I think that you know, if we look at this quote, if we create a culture where every teacher believes they need to improve, not because they are not good enough, but because they can be even better, there is no limit to what we can do. So we, we've got to believe, got to believe um, in those improvements. And the way to do that, for me, 
it's drilled in. So I think, it, as a sector, I think we sometimes too rely on external drivers. ETF are a fantastic organization with the regional network or local lead. It's great. Get involved in those by all means. But again, why are we waiting for that to come to fruition? When I was an FA leader, a great contact that I had, I just picked the phone. I went to my boss and I said, Do you know anybody at this college? Yeah, there was, there's an email. And within a couple of weeks, I went and I looked at the way they did things. I put a call and I put an email. No, I don't have time. If you don't have time to send an email, we've got a bigger challenge in terms of workload. So make the connections yourself. Um, there, there are ways of means of doing this. There is funding available actually at times to supplement those relationships. So, you know, many, many years ago, I met a colleague at, um, at, a, at a college um, so far down south, I, I thought maybe I was going to have to take the passport with it. Um, and was able to actually, you know, through teams, through email, just have those discussions. How do you do this? How do you do that? And share that best practice. We don't necessarily need funding or, or ring-fence time. You can do it by email. You know, I'm struggling with planning. Have you got anything? You can do it on Twitter. You can do it on LinkedIn. You know, you start struggling with feedback. Do you know anybody? Do you know any approaches? Can you just send it through? Quick email and you can improve. I think we can't necessarily always be a, a, a very inspirational boss that I once had. Um, it still works within within the organisation that I'm in there at the moment. They used to say to me that as English and math teachers, you can't necessarily be accountable for your input, for your, for your outcomes, sorry, but you can't be your input. You can't control what happens on the day with an exam. You can't control everything up to that point to an extent. So control your inputs. Where we have challenges, evaluate and reflect on yourself. Have I done everything that I could do? Student turns up with a pen and you kick them out. Have you done everything you could do? So we need a log, we need to track, we need to challenge, we need to support, we need to guide, we need to communicate. And that for me, as I say, a big part of that. Making sure that we create a culture where people believe that they should improve just because. So we need to create a culture where every teacher believes they need to improve, not because they are not good enough, but because they can be even better. I can be better, you can be better. We can all be better to a degree. And to do that, we need to listen to each other, but take a step yourself. You know, reach out to people who are, you know, have a look. I mean, the day of the dashboard will tell you, you know, where the colleges are that have good progress, that have good results. You'll know yourself. People who you meet, just reach out and talk to them and just have those conversations. Um, and a, a sort of a, a neat transition uh, to that, I have absolutely no qualms whatsoever in being one of those people. Um, my drive in whatever I'm doing, when I was an English teacher, um, the reason I got into teaching, quite frankly, I used to work in an office, um, a financial services office when I left university, and essentially my day was filled with phone calls of, of giving people news about how little the pension was worth. And I had that reflection, and I, I stepped up and sort of said to myself, what do I want to do to be happy? I want to be a teacher, and I want to help people. And I'm, I'm hopefully still, my staff hopefully agree with me, and the, the colleagues at Newcastle College would agree with me uh, that that's my driver. Does it make the ball go faster? Does it help young people? If it doesn't, why are we doing it? Um, and so I, I say, yeah, you know, any any uh, conversations that you want to have, any questions you want to ask me, the resources from this session will be uh, distributed and uh, available to you. Um, I must have ever thank Newcastle College for allowing me to do these sorts of things. Fabulous place to work. As you can see by the wonderful, uh, the wonderful space that I've got around me, lovely office that I'm in this morning. Um, give a follow on Twitter, Johnny K Teacher, and um, ask Johnny K Teacher. Um, not because I've got any sort of insight or anything, but because I steal and retweet the ideas of other people. Um, so you, you don't have to do all that running around. And then the last bit, buy the book. Uh, it's available on Amazon, uh, Waterstones, some, uh, some very, very good reviews, some positive interactions as a result of it, uh, improving math and English and further education. And hopefully, nearly perfectly, Chris, I'm done. And that's me. So thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you very much, Johnny. That was amazing. I'm, I wish I was teaching so I could go out and actually uh, put into practice everything that you were talking about there um, and sort of move forward. Um, I just would like to say thank you to everybody for attending today. Um, and you will get a copy of the recording and a copy of the slides through um, very shortly as well. And please watch this space for things that are going to be happening based off the back of this, based on what we've been planning for English and Mass Post 16 within Pearson as well. Thank you very much. And Nick, it's over to you to finish the event.